Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Mr. Hugo Parascano on the subject of NAFTA at 20. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm a senior fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation and an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo. Every week, we're joined by an expert in global governance, international public policy, or some other aspect of external affairs here to the studio in Waterloo. Today, my guest is Mr. Hugo Parascano. He is a senior fellow with the International Law Research Program here at CG and a former trade negotiator for the government of Mexico. Welcome to the show. Hello, Andrew. So NAFTA has just turned 20, and I wonder uh, if you might, just for a few minutes, say a little bit about the agreement, what's its overarching purpose? Yeah. Well, uh, the NAFTA is a free trade agreement, and that's what it does. It regulates trade, and uh, often people have uh, had broader expectations about NAFTA, but uh, that's what it covers, right. trade. It, uh, having said that, it, it covers, uh, or it, it is a fairly comprehensive uh, free trade agreement because it covers trade in goods and services. Right. It covers uh, cross-border investment as well. And uh, to that extent, it has some provisions on uh, movement of bu business purpose just to facilitate trade and investment relations. It also covers uh, the protection of intellectual property rights. And it certainly has institutional provisions, uh, for instance, on transparency and dispute settlement mechanisms. Um, that to, to the, the, the purpose was to ensure that the agreement would work well in the long run. Right. And uh, it also has an interesting chapter that was carried over from the prior uh, U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement, Chapter 19, which is a, spe a special dispute settlement mechanism for anti-dumping and uh, countervailing duty determinations. Right. So uh, <coughs> that is um, an experiment that was uh, created in the uh, U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement that was right. carried over to the NAFTA, but uh, that has not been replicated afterwards. Right. And are there things that are not covered in, in the treaty? I'm thinking of, of perhaps key omissions that um, might be, be in a future trade agreement. Well, I wouldn't uh, say that the, there are key omissions. And um, uh, like I said, uh, often people have broader expectations about the trade agreement, but right. it, it is not supposed to go beyond that. Uh, except that it does cover, for instance, uh, uh, the cross-border movement of people, but to a limited extent in right. order to facilitate trade. But it's, it is not an agreement on, uh, on, on migration. Um, <coughs> it has limited uh, uh, provisions on competition policy, for instance. So okay. it does have certain provisions that regulate uh, monopolies, state-owned enterprises, and other competition matters to the extent that they affect trade. But uh, the, the, the broader cooperation in competition, for instance, is left to bilateral arrangements, which we do have. Um, <coughs> on, on taxes, it, it really covers uh, taxation matters, again, to the extent that they affect trade. So certainly cross-border uh, or, or uh, not, not cross-border, but border duties. Uh, so import duties, for instance, and, and other border restrictions. And uh, uh, of course, there are obligations such as national treatment or the obligation to extend the most favored nation treatment on tax matters, but it is not a taxation agreement. Right. So um, <coughs> I would say that it is quite uh, comprehensive as a trade agreement. Now, it did, the NAFTA itself does not cover uh, topics such as labor or environment, but um, <coughs> the, because, of course, during the legislative approval process, uh, especially in the U.S., it got 
entangled in U.S. politics and labor and investment were important uh, topics. They were important topics for uh, the, uh, for Clinton when he was campaigning uh, to to for the presidency of the United States, and uh, uh, he had made commitments that NAFTA would be. Uh, consistent with labor and right. environmental objectives. So we did negotiate side agreements, and that is sort of the, the how they are unofficially called, side agreements right. on labor and environmental cooperation that may, they have not had, but they may have uh, an impact on trade if uh, the, the three countries uh, really miss behave in terms of labor or, or environment, but we have not faced, faced such situations. Labor and environment are now a more standard component of uh, newer right. uh, trade agreements. In, in the NAFTA, it was, uh, again, it was a first experiment. It was done uh, on-site agreements. Uh, but it is, uh, I, I would say, is probably uh, the more or the most comprehensive trade agreement that we still have. And it has served as a model for uh, free trade agreements in the whole of the Americas. Right. And one of the priorities for Canada when the treaty was being negotiated was the creation of the dispute resolution mechanism. Yes. Um, <coughs> which was a tremendously important, I think, innovation at the time uh, for the treaty. Could you say a little bit about these mechanisms and how they operate and the degree to which they're binding. Yeah. Well, for for the, the NAFTA has three distinct dispute settlement mechanisms, and um, I'll, I'll go through them one by one. Uh, two of them were uh, very important for Canada when it first negotiated bilaterally with the U.S. before Mexico actually right. came into the picture. So this is in the late 1980s. Um, <clears throat> the first one is a general dispute settlement mechanism, state-to-state -state dispute settlement, uh, which covers anything within the agreement. Right. So not, it, it is intended uh, to help the parties address and resolve uh, not just disputes, but any matter where they may have a difference, uh, for instance, of, of interpretation or the need to undertake uh, consultations um, <coughs> uh, on, on really any matters that are covered uh, by the agreement. Uh, but the main purpose of it, and that was uh, one of Canada's priorities when it negotiated with the U.S., was to have a mechanism that would ensure that the balance of negotiations uh, would be main maintained in the long run. Right. State-to-state -state dispute settlement mecha mechanisms, I guess one could say, that recognize that parties may breach the agreement. Uh, but they're not punitive in nature. They are not intended to punish uh, anyone for uh, a, a breach of the agreement. They're there to ensure that the agreement works as expected in the long run, recognizing right. that uh, in between there may be uh, breaches intended or unintended. But that, that is the purpose of those provisions. And that is how, uh, for instance, WTO dispute settlement works as well. Right. Um, <coughs> but uh, they're there to ensure that the rules are applied uh, well and the agreement uh, works well again, in the, the long and the very long uh, term. Right. Uh, and it was a priority uh, because at the time, Canada was concerned with increasing protectionism in the U.S. Right. It had one of the largest, or actually the largest trading relation with any, or between any two countries. It was uh, between Canada and the U.S. And it wanted to ensure that, w that uh, its trade with the U.S. would not be affected by protectionist measures. Right. Um, so uh, it was uh, key for Canada, and uh, uh, it, it was at the time a modern dispute settlement uh, mecha mechanism. It built on what was being negotiated at the time in the Uruguay uh, round, and uh, that, that is the first 
uh, dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, the second uh, dispute settlement mechanism that was uh, key for Canada, and uh, as far as I know, it was uh, probably the last issue to be decided between the U.S. and Canada was Chapter 19, which is right. the anti-dumping and countervailing duty uh, dispute settlement mechanism. This is an interesting experiment because what it allows the uh, parties involved, not necessarily the, uh, um, the, the states, but uh, the parties involved in uh, anti-dumping and countervailing duty matters, is to challenge the decisions issued by the investigating authority uh, that impose or uh, perhaps uh, reject right. the, the uh, uh, ADCVD cases to challenge those decisions before a binational panel, a panel composed by nationals of both parties, uh, two selected by each party and the third selected by one uh, party by lot. Right. And <coughs> The whole idea was, uh, well, there was not much trust um, by traders uh, and the Canadian government on the uh, U.S. tribunals. They, 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 there was the thought that they were either naturally or inherently biased towards U.S. producers, and they right. wanted to ensure that uh, having gone through an investigation, the, the final determinations could be challenged be before an impartial international tribunal, in this right. case, binational. So <clears throat> that was a key component. It was uh, an idea uh, that Canada had and th that it, it, it successfully uh, implemented, and that got carried over almost without any changes into the NAFTA. So that also was a key component. Canada at the time wanted, uh, actually it, its idea when it sat down at the negotiating table was that uh, there should be no anti-dumping or countervailing duties between uh, free trade partners. Right. That, that should be eliminated and uh, just let uh, trade flow freely. Um, but it was not successful in going that far. Right. But uh, nevertheless, it did uh, uh, at least uh, uh, came up with the idea of this dispute settlement mechanism to ensure that uh, the, the determinations would be reviewed by uh, an, an impartial and independent uh, tribunal uh, and not by the U.S. courts. So right. those were the key issues uh, for Canada. In the NAFTA, uh, a third mechanism was added, and that's the, the investor state dispute settlement mechanism, which is not, it is absent in the Canada-U.S. free trade agreements. Right. It had some provisions on investment, which, uh, which got, uh, which were uh, elaborated on in the NAFTA. The NAFTA uh, is uh, chapter 11 of the NAFTA has uh, broader uh, investment protections, including a dispute settlement that will allow, it, it, what it does is that it creates a private right of action. Right. It allows private parties to sue the states directly for breaches of international obligations on investment. That was uh, uh, not new. There, there were other examples out there in the world. There, there was the, the, the exit uh, convention that goes back to 1965 that provides for such a mechanism. But it was included in NAFTA Chapter 11 uh, as between the three NAFTA parties. So investors, foreign investors, in each of the three parties may sue the, the, the host government of the investment right. For what is interesting is that none of the states undertake obligations vis-a-vis -vis the investors themselves. There is uh, none of uh, the NAFTA parties negotiated anything with private investors. Right. The obligations are owed 
as between uh, well, Mexico owes uh, an obligation to extend national treat treatment to the U.S. and Canada and the other way around, but not to the investors themselves. However, right. it is the investors that have the right of action to sue the host governments. Okay. Now, critics of NAFTA, though, have pointed to Chapter 11 as uh, part of the agreement that actually undermines state authority and compromises the state's ability to enact policies or legislations for environmental controls, for instance, or setting labor standards. Is that a, are those criticisms justified? Um, I would say that there, uh, there are, or they are, uh, legitimate criticisms. I, I, I think it is legitimate that people, or to put it another way, I think that people are legitimately concerned. Right. But I think that it is uh, greatly misunderstood. Okay. Um, <coughs> and uh, the, what I would agree is a source of concern is that certain provisions of the NAFTA uh, are not as clear as the NAFTA parties intended, and in fact, uh, uh, the NAFTA parties have already clarified or, or have found a need to officially clarify some of those provisions. Um, <coughs> and, um, and, and, and that is a source of concern because it is, these are provisions that are interpreted by international uh, uh, tribunals. Right. And uh, to the extent that there are ambiguities in those provisions, of course, uh, those reflect in the performance of the dispute settlement system as a whole. However, I do think that they are, uh, that, that the concern is uh, misunderstood. Um, <clears throat> because uh, in my view, no, the NAFTA does not, uh, does not affect the party's right to regulate. Having said that, we must recognize that all regulation has costs. Right. And it has costs for private parties because it restricts uh, private parties' ability to act freely. Now, uh, it may be justified for right. health reasons or environmental reasons, but that does not mean that it doesn't come at a cost. And it depends on the degree of interference of the government, uh, how, how, how high the cost may be. So just to put it in context, uh, if we take uh, just hypothetically two measures in, the, in opposite extremes, uh, a permit, a construction permit, it certainly restricts the ability of private parties to construct. Right. Uh, and it may be well justified for zoning purposes or, or for other reasons. Uh, however, it is not very intrusive as a measure, and it may be seen as a cost of doing business. You might want to construct a building, go get your permit. Of course, that is going to involve certain costs, but it's a cost of doing business. On the other end, expropriation itself can be a regulatory measure. Uh, a country, uh, there, there was a case uh, involving Costa Rica, where uh, Costa Rica decided to expropriate a certain uh, land in order to protect turtles. And again, it may be well justified, but it's all the way at the other extreme. It takes property that was legitimately, legitimately acquired and owned by a foreign investor. And of course, if a country expropriates, it has to pay compensation. Right. And it's a sort of regulation that comes at a cost. In the, in the other extreme, it would seem though, even if the uh, underlying concern is quite legitimate, then if the government decides to expropriate, it should pay compensation, uh, even to address quite legitimate uh, uh, concerns. So, of course, in, in the middle of the spectrum, they're all very, very different kinds, and right. it's, it's a question of cost allocation, really. Uh, and that is what is interesting. And uh, one of the questions is, 
depending on the measure, who should bear the cost for a right. permit, like I said, a cost of doing business, and that seems to be uh, simple enough. In expropriation, it seems to be equally simple enough uh, that uh, it should be the government. But in tobacco regulation, for instance, the question, if, if the measure doesn't go as far as expropriating the business completely of private parties, uh, what should be the right cost allocation? Uh, what should be the cost for the enterprises for being involved in uh, a risky business? Right. A, a business that creates, creates uh, health risks. And uh, should that be part of their cost of doing that business? Uh, should there, uh, to the extent that these are public health issues, should uh, the public at large, through taxation, all, all, all of us who pay taxes, uh, of course, will contribute to the government co uh, government's cost in regulation? Should, uh, should uh, some of the cost be allocated to them as well. Right. What about the smokers? It's it's a voluntary. It's it's not illegal. Right. For one, uh, it is voluntary, and certainly today nobody can say that uh, smokers are not well informed of the risks that they're taking. Right. Should they bear some of the costs? Because, uh, of course, the state cannot leave someone just to die because. They, they are smokers. It has a duty to provide certain protection to persons. Right. But should they bear part of the cost? Uh, should they pay a higher tax just in case eventually uh, the governments need to take more uh, restrictive regulation? Uh, so the difficult issue is how to allocate those costs. Uh, and uh, it, that is not simple to, to undertake, but I think that's in the end uh, what should be looked at. Right. Investment protections as such are just uh, uh, one component, and, uh, of, or, or I would say the investment uh, dispute settlement provisions are one component of investment protections. And, uh, uh, they are really very basic. Uh, they may be worded very differently. Right. Uh, but it seems that every time we talk about national treatment, everybody roughly understands what we're talking about. That doesn't mean that it doesn't create problems when right. we get into the nitty gritty. But uh, it seems like national treatment, that's uh, fairly clear. Same thing with uh, the most favored nation treatment. Whatever better treatment you give to another nation, you have to extend to all others. Right. Uh, again, they may be worded differently, but it's, uh, it's quite basic. Expropriation, uh, we may dispute the quantum of expropriation, but the concept seems to be pretty straightforward. Okay. The freedom of transfers, uh, if an investor uh, comes and does business and needs to transfer in, in a country and needs to transfer uh, money or profits out or if it wants to pull out completely it should be uh, free to take uh, his uh, capital out of a country. Uh, in terms of the uh, fair and equitable treatment that's more ambiguous but if we research the history of it it's really also a basic pr uh, provision that was intended to protect investors where national treatment failed. Right. So uh, in economic international law, uh, or, or economic international law is concerned with how states treat foreigners, and that has been the case historically, uh, in the past centuries, we talked about property of right. foreigners abroad, not of investments. But today, because of capital flows, it's more in the concept of investment. Um, and international economic law is not concerned with how a state treats its own nationals. 
and if uh, it treats them as bad to fall below an international level, that's not the concern of economic international law. It may be on the human rights side, sure. it may be on labor, but not economic international law. But uh, foreigners cannot be treated below a certain standard. They cannot be denied access to justice. Right. They cannot be treated arbitrarily or capriciously, uh, even if nationals are treated that way. So historically, it is also a very basic provision. Admittedly, it, it is, uh, there are many ambiguities and uh, fair, what is fair and what is equitable is, may, may well be uh, subject to heated debates. Uh, but, but that was the initial intent. It was not intended to protect investors from every sort of government uh, action or interference. Right. Uh, that affects their, pro uh, their, their profits. But again, regulation involves costs, and the interesting question is how to properly allocate those costs. Right. Now, you mentioned earlier that Canada's main priority was to secure um, access to the U.S. market uh, and not mm. get caught up in U.S. protectionist policies. What did Mexico hope to get out of the agreement? Well, that was a really uh, uh, a turning point in Mexican economic policy. Uh, Mexico had a petrolized economy. It was heavily dependent on the production of oil. And it was borrowing heavily from, uh, initially from international sources uh, in, uh, um, in the late 1970s, uh, not just from international sources, but uh, fr from private lenders, um, to sustain its uh, for, for for development purposes. Uh, but of course, insta international institutions keep a closer eye on ho how funds are used. Right. Private lenders keep a closer eye on how they get repaid. Um, <coughs> And uh, so sort of that, that was the situation. Uh, the economy depended on oil and on uh, foreign debt. And uh, we, we f faced a crisis in the uh, late 1970s where oil prices dropped, right. importantly. And uh, Mexico could not repay its debts. So with the change of administration in the early 1980s, uh, it was clear that that situation uh, could not go on. And uh, uh, the incoming president, Miguel de la Madrid, uh, uh, made the decision that it, he, the Mexico needed to change its economic policy. It needed uh, a dramatic 180 degree turn in where it was going. So it began, uh, President de la Madrid, he began opening up the Mexican economy. Uh, he initiated a, a very important regulatory reform, uh, starting with a tax reform. Um, and uh, it, he began a process of privatizing state-owned enterprises. At one, at one point, Mexico owned everything from the national oil producing company to a bicycle producing company. Wow. So that was uh, how, uh, uh, how much involved the government was in uh, pr production, literally. So uh, <coughs> it also began, it, it, uh, we had made attempts at joining the GAD, but had postponed those in the, uh, we got more serious about it, and we joined the GAD in the mid-1980s, and uh, Mexico undertook the necessary economic reforms to be able to comply with our international obligations in the GATT. Um, <coughs> but Mexico, since after the revolution, has lived in six-year cycles. That's right. how long the presidency lasts, and there is no re-election. Uh, so every incoming president would have his, for better or worse, his own idea of uh, all types of policies, environmental, right. economic, uh, 
uh, democratic and, and so on and so forth. So <coughs> uh, it was not, it was clear where policymakers wanted, the, wanted to get, but it was not clear whether having got there, how long the reform would last. Right. So one of the ways that Mexico uh, saw to bring stability to a much broader economic reform was actually entering into a free trade agreement with the U.S. Right. Because the U.S., uh, as it is for Canada, is our lar largest trading partner. Uh, so it was quite clear that Mexico wanted a comprehensive trade agreement. That was one of the conditions that the U.S. imposed in Mexico gladly accept it. Uh, it was quite clear that uh, it wanted uh, to, to provide a predictable and uh, stable environment for foreign investment in order to not only to foster its development but right. to cement its economic reform. And I, in my view, that was Mexico's main objective. Right. We've got uh, just a couple of minutes left, but I do want to get your thoughts very quickly on what you think the agreement has to say about things like um, responding to climate change and energy cooperation. Well, the agreement itself uh, does not have much to say. There are a few environmental agreements that are placed in a uh, in a higher hierarchy uh, in the NAFTA, like, like the Montreal Convention, the provisions of those prevail over NAFTA provisions to the extent that there is any inconsistency. Uh, but the NAFTA is not an environmental agreement, and we do right. have a, an environmental side agreement that we, we talked about. Uh, however, that is one area where probably not the NAFTA itself, but, uh, or not, the, 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 the trilateral free trade agreement itself, but uh, where there is certainly the need for greater cooperation between the three NAFTA parties. And I think that there is a, 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 a big opportunity to increase cooperation on things like the environment, uh, certainly on migratory issues. Right. Uh, today on energy cooperation, the three countries are uh, energy producers and Mexico has opened up recently its energy sector. Uh, and, and, and those are great opportunities to actually uh, deepen cooperation. I don't see that that is happening. I, right. I, I see that uh, the eyes of the three NAFTA parties are set on other forums such as uh, uh, TPP, on other international sure. agreements and negotiations, Canada uh, or, or CETA for Canada, TTIP for the United States, TPP for all three. I think mm -hmm. that that is where uh, the three countries are focusing and uh, are, are losing sight of the benefits or of greater trilateral cooperation. Right. Hugo, this has been wonderful having you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. And thank you to our audience for tuning in. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter. <laughs>